Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge and Company. Two extraordinary people, Betsy Krebs and Paul Pitkoff, left their work in the family court to help young people growing too old for foster care. It's an overwhelming job, and it's also God's work because it is so frustrating, but it's also exhilarating. At least that's what I understand from your wonderful book in which you've explained your experiences and the young people that you work with. And the book is called Beyond Foster Care System, The Future for Teens. Uh, how did this all start? Well, first of all, is it exhilarating sometimes? Yes, I think that the, the thing uh, that is really quite moving is working with the young people. And that's yeah. what's exhilarating is, is the we were talking a moment ago about the resiliency is, is, is you, you learn a lot from young people and the uh, uh, being able to, to in a sense enjoy their own development and to take part in, in their, them becoming uh, successful adults is exhilarating. Yeah, it is. How did this start with the two of you? Uh, <laughs> question. Um, well, I, I was working as a lawyer in family court representing kids uh, after graduating law school. And I did that for, I was in my fourth year of doing that. Mm. And if you've spent any time in family court or working in social services, each year the stack of folders and cases sort of piles up. So um, I thought I was a very good lawyer for the kids that I represented, but the outcomes were not as good as I would uh, as I would hope for. Were you shocked the first time, you, first month that you were in family court? I was. I mean, it was exciting, also, you know, yeah. because you really feel like you're playing an important part yeah. in in people's lives. Um, and there's many, many very committed individuals yeah. in, in the that, that you meet yeah. there. Yeah. Um, in in working representing kids, I had a lot of contact with teenagers who were my clients, and I was just very and yes, exhilarating. It's it's really truly inspiring to talk with these young people because while my job was really to ask them where they wanted to live or if they wanted to go to a new group home or foster home, uh, they they so often wanted to talk to me about what their education was like, what they were going to do with their futures, where their what kind of lives they wanted to lead, and I really felt like that. I wasn't in a position to do anything to help them with those issues as their lawyer. So around that time I met Paul, who, <laughs> who came into family court, uh, uh, having come from law school himself, and he can tell you a bit about his background, but sort of from that together we decided to start a new organization to help teens uh, achieve you were their ten goals I'm going to speed it a little because we run out of time so quickly and we have so much to talk about. You were a tenured professor. Yes. Communications at Adelphi, and you decided what in the middle of your the middle of light was it a middle life crisis or something that you decided to become a lawyer or change it or do something or try something different, I guess, right? Well, what was interesting was I I, I fell into CUNY Law School, oh, and that uh, really affected uh, me. No so. wonder <laughs> CUNY Law School. I wondered how you got to be an intern in the family court. Yes, <clears throat> and. Um, and then when uh, I hadn't decided to leave academia until uh -huh. I ran into Betsy, and Betsy kind of influenced me uh, in the idea that we could do something for the young people that were in foster care, and also around education, and that that kind of interested me. And you you concentrated on teens, really. These are yes. are yes. kids who are what 16 and above, 15, 16, because children can be in foster care. But there's a term, which is a terrible term, aging out, that the state keeps them, in, will keep them in foster care till they're 21. But they can leave between the ages of 18 and 21 on their own. In New York right. State, yes. In New that's York right. State. Mm -hmm. And so you saw this need because of the kids not having the kind of direction, right? Exactly. I mean, we really felt like that the system um, was set up for one purpose, which was to protect younger children and sort of to treat family problems, right. but not to prepare young people for independence and for adulthood. And it seemed that if, since we had, we, the state, had taken these young people into our custody, that we sort of had an obligation to do better for them and when, not to leave them homeless or without an education. Or without when any children plans. reach 16, does that mean that they've been in the foster care system for a long time? I mean, most of those those teens have been there for a while. Um, some Do enter the system as some, teenagers. Since, yeah. Some are kids that have grown up in the system who have not been reunited or adopted, you know, reunited with their biological families or adopted, even though that's the goal for all children in foster care. Many linger in, in the system. So some, some, the ch let's just talk about a little bit about the population of the children, of these teens in, in foster care. Some of them are there 
because they're persons in need of supervision. That's not the majority, mm -hmm. though, is it? Or yeah. is it? No. Those are people who, when a, a custodial parent or somebody says, I can't take mm -hmm. care of this child anymore, is overacting or doing something. Right. Others are there because they have, they have no place else to go, right? But some of them do have some family people that they would like to be with, don't they? Uh, yeah, some do. Yeah. I think yeah. that's right. Um, and, you so, know, there's, there are a lot of people sort of in the system working to identify those family members and trying to keep them, keep teens with family members or to find them new <coughs> families to be with. So then you started an organization. You left the family court, you right. started an organization. And tell us about the organization. Uh, well, when we first started, we were much more focused on uh, helping teens become empowered in the system. And so we did a lot of work uh, that we talk about in our book around um, teaching teens what their rights were, community organizing with young people in the foster care system, uh, policy advocacy, having young people meet with legislators and commissioners. Um, what we learned from all this was that the young people were just as sort of talented and passionate as we thought they were. Um, but at the same time, they were still leaving the foster care system without any plans for their own future. And so we took a lot of the lessons that we learned about advocacy and how to work with young people uh, on advocacy projects. Excuse me. Go on. And developed a, <coughs> developed a model that we call Getting Beyond the System Self-Advocacy Seminars, which really helps every young person in foster care uh, learn to be an advocate for him or herself. Um, and to take control of their future. I, the, book, the book is fascinating, and, and I, I just read it, and I couldn't put it down because <laughs> it's, it's like a novel. And what's interesting about your project is how it changes and grows as you learn more, or you decide that you need new strategies, or this is what you need. It's not a static organization. And what's, what, what I find interesting is that it's a non-static organization that is up against a static bureaucracy, right? And well, I think that's why that's, we're non-static, right. is because we've tried so many different ways to change the static system. Yeah. And our book is is certainly critical of the system, and, and, and we try to distinguish the system from the people that work in the system. There are wonderful people that work in the system, and they do amazing work that they're not given enough credit for by our society and, and or recognition under tremendous uh, uh, handicaps from the system. It's the system that needs to be changed. And so I think that, that that's a very good point because I, I, I think that we have been frustrated and the frustration has generated a lot of creative energy on our part. And in a sense, the whole reason we have self-advocacy is at one point we, in a sense, we, we practically said we're giving up on the system. And we mm -hmm. actually say to the young people when they come into the system, uh, come into our program is we say there's very little we can do to change the system. What we can do is help you become strong advocates for yourself because you can't depend upon the system to uh, enrich your life. You have to do it. And, um, and in some ways w uh, what we've done that's somewhat different and, and, and been very rewarding is we put more responsibility on the teens than the system does because we say this is your life and you've got to take charge of it. And, uh, and the teens that come into the program respond very, very positively to that. But that's one of the problems with the system is that it doesn't offer them the opportunity to become empowered. I mean, that the system is a custodial system, that it's an impersonal system, uh, it seems to me. They, they do have a program called independent living. I mean, they acknowledge that there are ch young people who are going to age out of this place and that they know they're going to be independent, but it seems to me those programs are lacking a lot of the things that you're trying, that's what you're trying to respond to, right? I mean, one of the things is the low expectations, isn't it, of what's going to happen, what, who these children are, and what's going to happen to them. Low expectations, and, and somebody once pointed out to us, and I think it was a very useful idea, is that um, the system is, is developed around a mental health model, but in many ways they treat the young people that are in the system uh, as in, in a mental illness model. And so each young person is looked at in, in terms of, of what, their issue, what their mental illness issues are. And I think that that precludes a lot of attention on their education and just developing the kinds of skills that they have to have, intellectual skills and, and all sorts of uh, skills, to be, to be independent.
You tell the book, the book has different chapters, and they're around individual mm -hmm. youngsters. And um, the, some of their comments about the kind of education they were getting when they're in a group home, is it a group home or a res it's a residential treatment Either center one, yeah. where they have GED, where they're expected really to take the GED, not to get a high school diploma. Or w there was one, one young person who said that he's had the same teacher every year and the same book. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, uh, what can you do then? How can you learn something? And uh, how important it is. And in a f other funny way, I mean, it's really their parents who were dysfunctional more than them, isn't it, to a large degree? Well, th that's interesting too. Is is that um, the the one thing that I think is one of the big issues for most teens that are in foster care is this sense of stigma, and the rest of us, the the, the outside community, very often thinks that people are in foster care because they're some that they're there's something wrong with them. They're a problem teenager and otherwise they wouldn't be in foster care. And that certainly isn't true uh, uh, universally at all. But I also think, uh, I think in the work we've done, I've become uh, less uh, willing to blame it all on the parents also, uh, is, is that I think that uh, many of the parents really want the best for their kids. Yeah. And, um, they weren't well parented when right. they were growing up and so they don't have a lot of the, the the skills they don't have any advocacy skills and very often they get into some sort of problem whether it's economic or uh, a health problem and 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 so their their young person has to go into foster care but uh, the, those parents the biological parents are very important to the young people that are in foster care and one of the neat things is when we have graduation sometimes the biological family comes and they're so impressed with what their young person has done and uh, they want to be able to help them but very often they just don't have the facility to do it. So do you, you find when you see the, how do you get the, the youngsters, how, how, do you, how do you recruit them to come into the program? Well initially we uh, did a lot of outreach in the system yeah. um, having young people that worked for yeah. us go and do workshops or work with eight, you know, foster care agencies. That's how it started. It started with one person. Exactly. <laughs> um, and, um, and then we would have young people from all different agencies come and that's really when we were developing and sort of testing yeah. the model. And now we're working in partnership with social services agencies where they're running the Getting Beyond the System seminars at their agencies to help young so people. So are you finding less resistance from these organizations than you did at the beginning? Somewhat. I mean, I think that, you know, we've certainly um, grown and changed some of our approaches, I think. Um, and I think, I think there's this general acknowledgement that the system isn't working for teens and we need to do something different. And, um, you know, that's why we're, we're sort of pleased that, the, that our book is actually coming out now because we feel like there's a, it's a good moment right now to have this conversation about what we can all do to change the system. Because people sort of know it hasn't been working for teens, but nobody really wanted to take it on. Um, and now it, now it feels like that there's definitely more momentum and resources going towards thinking about alternatives to sort of it's traditional. The, the system itself is, a, is basically a dehumanizing system, both to, it seems to me to the, the youngsters who are in it and to the people who work in it. I, mean, I think I think that I mean, was one of the interesting things that we frustrating things is uh, our program is all about empowering teens, and then you you start to realize that many of the people that are working in the system are really not empowered, and so how can you expect them to help to right. empower a teen if they themselves aren't? Right. So you're right. It, it, yeah. it, it, I mean, one of the one of the people, things I remember is one of the the staff saying to this kid. Uh, there's nothing wrong with a GED. I got a GED. What's wrong with it? I mean, all the, the efforts at improvement reflect negatively on the people that are working for them. Because a lot of those jobs are low paid and a lot of them are very difficult, right? Exactly. It's a, it's a very big dilemma. So let's talk about your empowerment program because it's interesting. The Socratic method. Is that what you call it, right? <laughs> I went on the internet and I learned it. And, uh, and there's a wonderful example on some site about a man who goes in to teach math. Oh, you got and that I love one. That's that wonderful. One. Yes. Yeah. Anyway, let's talk about that. Well, uh, the background is that in this, in the facilities that these kids are in, or under the rules and restrictions, they're always told what they can't do, right? And they are lectured to. And what they should do. And what they should. They're do. given <laughs> prescriptions. Yes. And I think 
it's quite useful that Betsy and I both came from a, a legal background because uh, when you go to law school, um, you, you you spend all that time with you know entrenched in in the Socratic method, and also uh, uh, law is 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 basically about advocacy. So I think that we were in a position to to break down advocacy into elements that uh, would make it. Uh, uh, easier for young people to understand, but w when we uh, so I think we uh, uh, like so many things I think we just fell into it. So we used the Socratic method and we developed cases which we wanted uh, we wanted the material the curriculum material to be relevant to the students. Uh, so what is it? Just define in one sentence the Socratic method. The Socratic method. <laughs> uh, Socrates believed that all uh, understanding comes from the individual, doesn't come from the teacher, and so that it's it's up to uh, what you would classically call the teacher to ask questions to have the student begin to develop understanding about something rather than to give them a prescription. So instead of telling them how to advocate, okay. is you're asking them questions um, that get them to understand that. And the students find that uh, both th th they learn self-advocacy fr from this method, but they also found, find it very empowering. Um, and also they find it very frustrating because the first couple of weeks they say to the facilitator, why aren't you giving me the answer? And then they start to realize that they have great intellectual power themselves. And that's what we're really trying so to do. So that's how they discover that they have to be concerned about their futures, right? Education, jobs, where they're going to live, how they're going to live, how they manage their money, all of these different exactly. things. Exactly. That's a good point, is, is that in a classic uh, independent living class, you might get a group of, of young people around and, and teach them something about budgeting. And it's it's... Abstract, irrelevant to them yeah. because it's abstract and um, so we have cases and, and the students start to ask questions well how can this person live on this kind of money and, and, and they become interested in it and then they start to really understand that budgeting is becomes a really important thing. So and then it ends up how do they do it? They decide they know they have to work they're gonna have to make money and you then encourage them to think of what they're gonna do well, the, the thing well, that's, the thing that's very exciting about working with the young people in the program is that we say to every student that comes into the seminar, what do you want to do with your life? Whatever they want, we don't judge them because that, that's another element of our program that's very important. We don't judge the decisions they make. Is We're empowering them to be self-advocates to get what they want, not what we, what we want. And we say, what do you want to do? And whatever they want, as crazy as it may sound to us, we set up an informational interview with a person in that field. Um, so if somebody said th they wanted to be a, a TV host, we would ask you if you would give them an informational interview. And then they're on their own. They, they, they go to that uh, meeting. And many of them become very motivated from that meeting and start to learn what it takes to get into that career, or they learn enough about the career that they decide maybe that's not for me, or that there's something else. That so, do they get another in. chance at another interview? We would like to see them continue to do this yeah. all the time. And one of the things that Betsy and I are working on is to try to get our program in foster care agencies where they could support the young person having a number of, of informational interviews until mm -hmm. uh, and, until the young it. person finds exactly what they want. It happens to be a want. question that I rebel against. I mean, I, I think that a question when you're interviewing and when you, you know, you go and talk to someone about what you're going to do with your, mm. where do you see yourself in five years? How do I know where I see myself in five right. years? You didn't know where you were going to see yourself mm. in we 20 years. And, and, and we, get, <laughs> we get that criticism when we do our training and it's a very good point. And, and what we try to explain, and, 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 it, and it's true, is we're not, okay. this is not about picking a career, it's about okay. learning the process. Yes. And, and so you can apply, when, when, the, when this young person changes their mind, as I did when I was in my 40s, they can <laughs> go do an right. informational interview. And one of the, it was, who, what was her name, Rash, it's not Rashina, who wanted to be the R&B uh, singer. Mm -hmm. Ebony. Ebony, who wanted to be an R&B singer, so she went to a record company and she came back and said, I need a backup plan, right? <laughs> but, uh, it, I mean, but that actually, I mean, that is a good yeah. example because Ebony, you know, came into our program and said, I want to be an R&B singer and she had never sung before. She didn't really know anything about it. And then we sent her to meet with 
somebody at uh, Sony Music, yeah. and he told her about the field, and also that he had his own kind of personal yeah. ambitions as a musician, but that he instead was working at Sony doing something sort of related, and encouraged her to go to college and to um, pursue music from a, from a number of angles. And, you know, she came back to the class, and she's like, you got to have a backup plan, <laughs> you have to, you know, you, you have to go to college. And if we, you know, Paul was facilitating the group at the time, if he had told her I had, you know, yeah. you, you know, I mean, never mind the she singing, was very, you should go to she, college. She was also very hesitant at the beginning, yes. of, in the beginning of the course. Yeah, yeah. So but do you do a study of what happens? To, I mean, do you track these, these kids after you've, they've, come out of foster care and that you've had these seminars and they've attended As much as we can. It's difficult. And um, as we were saying before, really the government doesn't track them. So yeah, it's that, hard for us to track them since we don't have That was astonishing to me that, the gov that there is no yeah. record in the city as to what happens to kids. I mean, we, we, we've always had that argument about job training. You know, how long has a person held the job that you've paid mm -hmm. for the training? But here, these are our kids who've been in foster care system, and you don't follow to see where they are. Yeah, no, and and you know we've invested you know hundreds of thousands yeah. of dollars in, in each one while they were in foster care, and then to not know how what many of them do, do they? Well, now you don't you're you're not as personally involved with them because you're training other people. Correct. So when you were personally involved with them, did you continue to have relationships with them? Yes, and we still do yeah. with many of them. Yeah. Um, so it's interesting to see because we're teaching them something that, you know, is uh, sort of a tool that they can use in many different ways. It's not like, you know, we would like to take credit ourselves for every young person that goes to college right. or everyone that establishes a career. But we know also they've had other people helping them, too, along the way. Yeah. And, um, you know, and some young people use it in different ways, maybe not necessarily to go to college, but to... Um, uh, you know, to establish a better relationship with their family or to find a better place to live. So, so you've copyrighted this this training program. Well, we we've, we've copyrighted the book and the book. we've trademarked the uh, trademarked. I'm the, sorry, the, it's the, the word, the, the yeah. concept. Mm -hmm. But but our uh, uh, we obviously what we want is to see as many organizations using this as possible so we're not trying to be exclusive about it but we we think that we have something to offer in in helping organizations understand how to facilitate the seminar and how to to keep it at a level that really works was it hard for you to the first times that you didn't do the training was it hard for you to give it to other people to do the training very hard, <laughs> um, and 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 I resisted it, and I felt people were doing it wrong. And what's wonderful and and, and about the seminar, and we purposely designed it that way, is we wanted it to be not a canned program that says this is the way you have to do yeah. it, but we wanted it to to build on the creativity of the individual who would be doing it, which means that you have to give up the pride yeah. of ownership because they're going to do it somewhat differently. And I think that's very important because if you want to engage students, the people who are facilitating something have to have something a involved. Stake in it too. A stake yeah, in absolutely. it. Yeah. Do you how many? Do you know how many uh, social service agencies there are involved in foster care, and what percentage of them you've got this program in? In New York City yeah. or in, in the, New York City? Uh -huh. um, I'm not sure what the number of agencies. I mean, I know it's sort of decreased a lot, the number yeah. that have contracts with the city around foster care now. I would imagine around 20 or 30. And how point. many of you train, how many are using your, your We're starting program? to reach more and more. I mean, we have one sort of major replication with Safe Space, um, mm -hmm. and, and so they're planning and they're to reach they're delighted with it, teams. I understand, yeah. Um, and then we have a lot of people from different social services agencies coming to our trainings now who are then taking yeah. it back and so Did you ever get into the uh, into the program up in Westchester where you were <laughs> it was so <laughs> compelling to me it's an illustration of how the staff resisted and how you lost your cool <laughs> or you felt you did anyway I was rooting for you I thought it was terrific did you ever get back into that program No <laughs> So we have about 3 minutes left in this program um, can we say something about the informational interviews? Absolutely, and, uh, yes. Um, so one of the important aspects that I think draws a lot of young people and professionals to our model is the fact that we have every young person that goes through the program connect with the leading professional in the city for an informational interview in the field of that student's choice. So it's just been fantastic to get professionals from the media, from the healthcare professions, from the arts, from really every walk of life who volunteer to provide these informational interviews 
really education and career counseling to young people in foster care. And we feel it's, it's such a valuable way for people in the community to get involved to... Um, Absolutely. Because we're not saying, well, you have to be the mentor for the next right. 10 years. This is really a, a kind of a limited opportunity. However, many of those limited opportunities turn into longer term relationships. Yeah. And, and then the and young they don't person have to be trained. Like, That's the other thing that yeah. I like. You don't train yeah. people to do these interviews. Because the people are because talking about something important. that they know about right. and they're just sort of, and they're used to doing that, it. Right. That the kids are going to have to come up with that anyway. Yeah. And yeah. then the young person feels especially good if they do get an internship yeah. or they establish a mentoring yeah. relationship because it's really something they've yeah. done on their own. So. But you don't facilitate internships. You do, you're, you're now just doing interviews. In a safe right. space, for instance, it maybe does. 20 or 30 percent of the students got internships on their own it's through the information, which are much more solid in, internships yeah. than just creating one. So you have a website. Yes. And if people are interested, they should respond. Yes. And, do you, and your, your telephone number, we'll put that on the screen also okay. so that you can do that. Um, Great. And then we have to come back and talk some more about the future, more beyond this, what else we could do about the system. I know you've left the system, <laughs> yeah. but we certainly can't let it stay the way it is, can we? No. Yeah. And we have to be innovative and creative and what? I think everything's up for grabs. I think we really have to reevaluate whether we even need a system like foster care for teenagers. It may be something, something very different. So it truly is exhilarating when you find that these are a group of kids who, no, who people had no expectations for, that they're like other young people, ambitious and want to have. And it's not a just good that. Life. What's what's really exhilarating is when the informational interviewers call us and they say the, the kid you sent us is just terrific. Uh, that is really moving. So these children are terrific. Yeah. And thank you very much because you're also terrific. <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>